Well, we're going to pray together and then we're going to look at God's word. Father, we thank you for this incredible season of Christmas and we ask today that you'll quieten our hearts and our minds. They'll be able to hear your word and what you're saying to us and that they'll give us a fresh revelation of our Lord Jesus. In his name we pray today. Amen. I want to read to you this morning from John's Gospel. John chapter 1, verses 14 to 18. It says this, the, Lord, the, sorry, the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. There's some wonderful information contained in these verses that tell us so much about the mystery of Christmas. Mystery is an interesting English word. And mystery, it, it covers a lot of territory because there are lots of different kinds of mysteries. I mean, we have a, a mystery novel like an Agatha Christie murder kind of novel. So the mystery of trying to, to work out the whodunits. And that's kind of entertaining. We have uh, all sorts of scientific mysteries. I mean, if you think about photosynthesis, you know, that's an incredible process by which Light is transforming carbon dioxide and water into plant food. How amazing is that? What a mystery. There's the mystery of space, which we're exploring more and more. And you see beautiful pictures at the moment from the, from the Lages Space Telescope, exploring the mysteries of space. There's a certain mystery of electricity, how we harness that and just turn the jolly switch on and there's, there's light. Who understands how all that works? But the greatest of all mysteries has to be the incarnation of the Son of God, Jesus coming into the earth. That moment in time and eternity when, when God chose by his own means to become a man. And today I want to look very briefly at this subject from John's Gospel. And in, in the prologue, prologue to his Gospel, this is kind of closing off the, the, the first chapter and it's, it's like listening to the finale of a mighty musical composition. You hear the rolling drums, the crashing cymbals, the, the entire percussion section of the orchestra comes alive, the harpist fingers are flying across the harp, the, the trumps, trumpets are blasting. And there are these, in these five verses, there are three interesting, fascinating facts that will arrest us, I think, regarding the coming of our Lord, the mystery of God becoming man. So let's have a look at the first of these. The first one is the great condescension. Why did Jesus come? The great condescension. It says this in the Bible. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. To condescend means to lower oneself to a level not normally occupied, physically, mentally or socially. It means to descend voluntarily to the level of another person. Now, with human beings, we can condescend to come down to someone else's level. And often that's not done with great kindness. You know, we have an air of contempt and snobbery and, and haughtiness in human condescension. But there's another side to the use of this word. It also means to graciously, willingly do something regarded as beneath one's dignity. I think that's what God did when he became flesh, with a my mysterious mixture of divine grace and love, he performed the greatest act of condescension of all time and all eternity. The word that John personified is the very expression and the very manifestation of God himself. The creative power of God was in the word. In John chapter 1, verse 3, it says, Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. That's an incredible thing to think about. The limitless power of God, the word of God, condescending to be compressed into human flesh. And John uses an interesting word 
It's a crude word when it comes to the, the Greek reading. It's a blunt word, flesh. The sophisticated Greeks, they recoiled from the word flesh in regard to deity. Flesh to them was corruptible, temporary, and doomed to be destroyed and cast aside. No God would deal with anything as degrading as human flesh. Yet that's exactly what God did. He entered human flesh, which stands for the whole person. He entered into the whole person. And in becoming flesh, God accepted the the limitations of humanity. He became vulnerable to those natural human, human tendencies that accompany the flesh. Hunger, thirst, physical weariness, pain. Jesus experienced all of that. And emotional traumas that we experience. Disappointment and sorrow and hurt and loneliness and rejection. Jesus experienced all of that. And because Jesus had no sin nature, he experienced all of that without the taint of sin which we have. And whilst our Lord Jesus committed no sin whilst he was on the earth, he experienced sin in a far more overwhelming way rather than actually committing sin. And when you consider Jesus hanging on the cross and he cries out, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? You can hear the pain in his voice. What caused him to to sweat great drops of blood and to plead with his heavenly father, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Jesus was not about to, to succumb to the temptation to sin. It was worse than that. He actually became sin for us. All the sordid sins of mankind were compressed together and put on the person of our Lord Jesus. He became sin for us. Well, John the Apostle says that Jesus lived for a while among us. Literally, it means he pitched his tent or he cast his lot in with us. Jesus moved in with us. What a God we have that he would move in with us and experience life just like you experience life. No God's ever done that except for the one true living God. But there's also an amazing discovery in these verses. In verse 14, it says, We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So there's another word of deep significance in the description of the Lord's incarnation, of the coming of Jesus. It is that word glory. Human beings can achieve a degree of earthly glory. You know, if if a person performs some sort of outstanding deed or a really benevolent act or makes some great monetary contribution to a worthy cause, you know, they're often these people receive glory. There'll be admiration, there'll be appreciation, or, or if someone makes an astounding discovery. Now, Louis Pasteur, with the, with, the, with the pasteurization of milk, made milk products safe for everybody to consume. These people have a degree of glory. But the first time we see the glory of God is in the book of Genesis when he declares, let there be light. But the sun, the moon, and the stars hadn't been created yet. So what was the light that was shining everywhere? This indescribably beautiful light. It was the glory of God in all of his heavenly brightness that was glowing across the whole of creation. God's glory filled the earth with indescribable beauty. And the glory of God appears next in the Bible in the mysterious cloud that hovered over the Israelites after crossing the Red Sea until they entered into the promised land 40 years later. But John writes, we have seen his glory. So he writes of the glory of God in Jesus Christ. The glory of God in Jesus was manifested every time that our Lord Jesus performs a miracle and in his life-changing teachings that arrested the people, convicted them of their sins and showed them God's incredible desire to forgive them and make them his children. Jesus' glory was revealed when he was transfigured on the mountain and Moses and Elijah appeared with him before the three disciples, Peter, James and John. But what about now? Would you like to see God's glory? Yeah, you would, I'm glad. 
because it's, it is possible for us to observe God's glory today. Let me read to you from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says this, And we, that's us, God's people, who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Where is the glory of God to be seen right now? It's inside the Christian person. Because you have the Holy Spirit, the glory of God is increasing as we become more like Jesus day by day by day. God's glory does not abide in one body now as it did in the body of Jesus. Now the person of the Holy Spirit and the glory of God indwells every believer. So this is not just some sort of stained glass experience I'm talking about anymore. But it's in the marketplace on Monday, it's in the schoolroom, it's on the athletic field, it's in the everyday tasks at home, it's in the old people's home. It's right there. You can experience the glory of God in the hearts of people. And we can take part in the glorious works of our God as well. Sometimes we're afraid of the social gospel and we skirt around the edges of desperate human suffering because it's just so big, what can we do? But we can express the glory of God with supernatural effectiveness in such situations. Now, Jesus reacted to human suffering when he healed the sick and crippled bodies. He reacted to human hunger when he fed the multitudes. He reacted to human sorrow when he raised Lazarus and the widow of Nain's son. So let's not forget the poor this Christmas. We participate in the glorious work of our God as we share in the work of Australian Baptist World Aid. Let's not forget that. But the crowning statement that John provided for us is a startling revelation in verse 18. It says, No one has ever seen God, but God the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Moses, one of God's great leaders of people, he had an overwhelming desire to see God. We read about that in Exodus uh, 33. And this was not just a, a mere human curiosity, you know, what's God look like? But it was a, the compulsion of a man who bore the awesome responsibility of leading the people of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. Often Moses would reach the point of exasperation. Why? Because of the people's rebellion against his leadership and feeling the extreme loneliness and the sense of failure which I think every leader surely must feel at some time. Moses believed that if he could see God's glory, if he could just see that, then he could press on with the great work that he had to do. Well, John declared that in Jesus, we have the full revelation of God. No longer is God some far away mysterious being, awesome and unapproachable in his glory. No. Rather, in Jesus, he's communicated the love and the tenderness of God through his teachings, his compassion towards the sinful, hurting, desperate people. The people said, no man ever spoke like this. How amazing. They were talking of Jesus. And even those who persecuted Jesus, the Roman centurion who was in charge of the squad that crucified Jesus said this, this man really was God's son. How incredible. Jesus gave to the world the eternal revelation of who God is, what he longs to become, to those who will place their faith in him. So what can you say about God today? You can observe his glory, not with your natural eye at the moment, but with the eyes of your soul. You can know what God is like through a personal encounter with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. You can experience the wonder that Joseph experienced when the angel revealed to him that his beloved Mary would give birth to the Son of God who would be the Word made flesh. You can experience that today yourselves. Brothers and sisters, it's my prayer for you that this Christmas you would have a fresh revelation of God. And that you would experience God for yourselves in wonderful ways as you do the work that God has prepared you to do during this coming year. May the Lord bless you. May you truly have a blessed Christmas, every one of you. Would you join me in prayer? 
Father, we give you thanks and praise for your word that reveals to us yourself through the person of Jesus, our Savior and our Lord. We give you thanks and praise for this glorious Christmas time that we can share together as friends and family. Help us to love one another with the love that you give us and to demonstrate that we truly do follow the risen Savior. In his name we pray today. Amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.